Hello everyone, this is Mr. Rensis Zigger dose of the Science Department of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm going to discuss to you the introduction to meteorology. This video lecture aims to augment with the uploaded modules in your LMS. So at the end of this session, we can define meteorology and other related terms. We may be able to recall the different contributions of the scientists to the development of meteorology as a science. We, are going, we can also discuss the Earth's atmosphere and the varying temperatures of the layers of the atmosphere. And that lastly, we can discuss the, the climate from weather. As part of your task, you need to supply information on these three columns. So, what I know column lists the questions um, you have in your mind in what I want to find out. And you list the things that you know about the topic and what I know. And after reading the whole module, you list the things you learned in this column. So to start with, meteorology is from the Greek words meta means beyond, eora means suspension, and logos means discourse. The study of the atmosphere and all of its related phenomena is called meteorology, a term whose origin dates back to the days of Aristotle. And it was believed that meteorology is one of the oldest observational sciences in human history and maybe the most relevant to a broad segment of society. Some of our first observational meteorologists and weather forecasters were shepherds, farmers, and sailors whose livelihoods and safety depended upon understanding and predicting the weather. The task of meteorology are to understand the processes and phenomena in the atmosphere. It explains weather, climate, air quality, climate variability, and change. Casual relations like water resources and availability, and their spatial and temporal variations. Meteorology also applies physical and chemical laws. By understanding of and research in meteorology, requires basic knowledge in mathematics, physics, chemistry, statistics, computer science, and modern technologies. So, in history of meteorology, remember that humans has, have always been concerned about weather. Sailors and millers needed knowledge on the winds, Farmers worried about too few or too much precipitation or the timing of precipitation or flooding. Often laws governing atmospheric processes were not derived with better understanding the atmosphere in mind, but because of other necessities. Findings from other dis disciplines have been integrated, adopted, and or synthesized for use in meteorology. Often laws governing atmospheric processes were not derived with better understanding the atmosphere in mind, but because of other necessities. As what I've said, because of necessity. So when we, some of the, uh, some of the farmers and uh, sailors depend on the 
observation of winds, for example, of precipitation, because that is needed in their respective works. At first, the concept of a global water cycle dates back at least 3000 BC when King Solomon wrote that all rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place from where the rivers come, neither they return again. So the first known rainfall measurements by by Cautilia of India in 2400 BP served to determine taxes that depended on rain amount. Also, Babylonians provided some basic mathematics and defined the four main directions, the north, east, south, and west, and the intermediary directions, northeast, southeast, southwest, and northwest. For Greeks, they contributed methodologically to meteorology. Around 430 BC, the Greeks made the first wind instruments, but the first reliable instrument to determine wind direction and speed were not developed before the 17th century. About 400 BC, Hippocrates published airs, waters, and places a study of climate and medicine. As a years later, Aristotle wrote Meteorologica. Now, Thales of Meletus applied meteorological knowledge to predict an abundant olive crop one summer. He wisely bought all olive presses in his immediate vicinity and became a rich man as his prediction was right. So as what I've said earlier, it was due to their needs or their necessities. But unfortunately, they don't really know that they are already studying meteorology. About 300 BC, Theophrastus published on the signs of rain, winds, storms, and fair weather. Seneca discussed various aspects of atmospheric phenomena in natural questions which mainly based on previous works by Greek authors. In the Middle Age, progress in meteorology stagnated. About 1170, Cremona translated Aristotle's Meteorologica, which finally was first printed in 1474. In 1543, Copernicus published his De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, in which he showed that the Earth is part of a vast solar system. Teresa Shelley built the first mercury filled barometer in 1644. Uh, also, there will be uh, con uh, construction of the first water filled barometer in 1644. 54 at Magdeburg. Uh, on the other hand, the aneroid barometer was invented in 1843. Galileo Galilei invented the gas thermometer and um, Torricelli's mercury barometer led to the invention of the liquid in glass thermometer in the mid 17th century. The Fahrenheit and Celsius that we are using as present develop reasonably scales for thermometers. Okay, Usually here in the Philippines, we use degree Celsius. Hooke developed a pressure plate anemometer that measured the deflection and force of the wind on a vertically hanging metal sheet. In 17th century, the first cup anemometer was developed in France and it was based in the principle of windmills that were used in 644 AD in Persia or in Iran, if I'm not mistaken. So based on ideas of Crifts da Vinci invented the basic principle of hygrometer 
an instrument to me measure the humidity of the air. Asman also invented the aspiration psychrometer that still is widely used to measure the water vapor content. He also introduced a rubber balloons to measure wind velocity by following the balloons by theodolite. After the World War II, the use of radar simplified the tracking of weather balloons and today, radiosodes use GPS. With regards to modern meteorology, the first half of 20th century brought great advances in turbulence and atmospheric boundary layer or ABL, the fifth, um, most uh, usually in physics. Uh, it has formulated the ABL and turbulent flow theories with Prandtl number as a parameter. Von Neumann was also involved in the development of the first electronic computer made weather forecasting its main application. So finally, in 1950, the first computer-based weather prediction was made. And in 1956, Phillips performed the first successful numerical simulation of the general circulation of the atmosphere. With those inventions and uh, contributions of the different um, um, persons in the history, we come up with the study of meteorology as used to forecast weather, our day-to-day -day weather. And we can observe already that um, it is more advanced to predict the weather and so that we can prepare for the bad weather if, if properly disseminated to everybody. Now let's move on to the Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere is a delicate life-giving blanket to air that surrounds the fragile air Earth. In one way or another, it influences everything we see and hear, and it is intimately connected to our lives. So the atmosphere that originally sur surrounded Earth was probably much different from the air we breathe today. Earth's first atmosphere was most likely made up of hydrogen and helium, the two most abundant gases found in the universe, as well as hydrogen compounds such as methane, the CH4, and ammonia. Of course, with, these, uh, with the presence of these um, elements and uh, compounds, it makes our atmosphere toxic to humans. Through chemical and biological processes, as the Earth evolved, much of the carbon dioxide became locked up in the carbonate sedimentary rocks, such as limestone. With much of the water vapor already condensed and concentration of carbon dioxide dwindling, the atmosphere gradually became not dominated by molecular nitrogen, which is usually not chemically active, or this is what we call the uh, gaseous nitrogen in the atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere appears that molecular oxygen, the second most abundant gas in today's atmosphere, probably began an extremely slow increase in concentration as energetic rays from the sun split water vapor into hydrogen and oxygen during the process of photodissolation. I mean, photo disassociation, dissociation. The hydrogen being lighter probably rose and escaped into the space while the oxygen remained in the atmosphere that makes our atmosphere rich also in oxygen, which makes um, life possible in the Earth on the Earth's surface. 
The molecular nitrogen occupies about 78% and the molecular oxygen about 21% of the total volume of air in the atmosphere. The concentration of the invisible gas, water vapor, however, um, varies greatly from place to place and from time to time. The carbon dioxide here, the CO2, a natural component of the atmosphere, occupies a small but important percent of volume of air, about 0.04%. And your carbon dioxide is said to be one of the greenhouse gas that makes our um, temperature on the surface of the earth ambient for life. Carbon dioxide enters the atmosphere mainly from the decay of vegetation, but it also comes from volcanic eruptions, a minute amount of it, the exhalation of animal life from the burning of fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas, and from deforestation. The removal of carbon dioxide, on the other hand, from the atmosphere takes place during the food production of plants known as photosynthesis. Because as plants consume carbon dioxide, it produces an organic product, which is a glucose, and an oxygen in return for um, the life on Earth. Carbon dioxide is then stored in roots, branches, and leaves of the plants. This diagram shows the main components of the atmospheric carbon dioxide cycle. So the gray lines shows the process that put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, whereas the red lines here shows processes that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The atmospheric pressure decreases rapidly with height, as what you observe in this illustration. Okay, Climbing to an altitude of only 5.5 kilometers, where the pressure is 500 MB, would put you above one half of the atmosphere's molecules. The layers of the atmosphere as related to the average profile of Earth temperature above the Earth's surface. The heavy line illustrates how the average temperature varies in each layer, as what you observe here. Okay, the trend, observe the trend. So the region of circulating air extending upward from the Earth's surface to where the air stops becoming colder with height is called the troposphere. The troposphere here is the first layer from the surface of the Earth. Troposphere is from the Greek word tropin, meaning to turn or to change. Thus, in this region or in this layer of atmosphere, where on average, the air temperature remains constant with height and is referred to as isothermal or equal temperature zone or isothermal zone. The bottom of this zone marks the top of the troposphere and the beginning of another layer, which is the stratosphere. The stratosphere, the stratosphere, the boundary is called as your troposphere. The height of the troposphere, I mean tropopause, that separates, or the this is the boundary of stratosphere and troposphere, and it is called again as tropos tropopause. The height of the tropopause usually varies, and it is normally found in higher elevations over equatorial regions and it decreases in elevation as we travel 
toll warm. Generally, the tropopause is higher in summer and lower in winter of all attitude, latitudes. Next layer of the atmosphere is the mesosphere. Above the stratosphere is the mesosphere, or also known as the middle sphere or the middle layer of the atmosphere. And the boundary near 50 kilometer, which separates these layers, is called the stratopause. The air at this level is extremely thin and the atmospheric pressure is quite low, averaging about 1 mb. The air temperature in the mesosphere decreases with height, a phenomenon due in the part to the fact that there is little ozone in the air to absorb solar radiation. The molecular or level or the molecules here are able to lose more energy than they absorb, which results in an energy deficit and cooling. That is why it is said to be the coldest layer of the atmosphere, the mesosphere. So we find air in the mesosphere becoming colder with height up to an elevation near 85 kilometers or 53 miles. At this altitude, the temperature of the atmosphere reaches its lowest average value about 290 degrees Celsius or 2,130 degrees Fahrenheit. The hot layer on the other hand of the atmosphere is said to be thermosphere. So the thermosphere or the hot layer above the mesosphere is the thermosphere. So the boundary that separates the lower, colder mesosphere from the warmer thermosphere is called mesopause. In the thermosphere, oxygen molecules absorb energetic solar rays, warming the air. Because are relatively few atoms and molecules in the thermosphere, the absorption of a small amount of energetic solar energy can cause a large increase in air temperature. Also, because the amount of solar energy affecting this region depends strongly on a solar activity. So, it depends on the activity of the sun. The temperatures in the te uh, thermosphere vary from day to day. It is in the thermosphere where charged particles from the sun interact with air molecules to produce a dazzling aurora displays. And aurora can be uh, experienced most probably in the northern layers, or I mean the northern part of the earth. Lastly, of course, we have the exosphere. At the top of the thermosphere, about 500 kilometers above Earth's surface, many of the lighter, faster-moving molecules traveling in the right direction actually escapes the Earth's gravitational pull. Thus, it is called as the, the layer as an exosphere. Sphere. The region where atoms and molecules shoot off into space is sometimes referred to as the exosphere, where it represents the upper limit of our atmosphere, or the outer layer of the, of the atmosphere. The atmosphere, however, can also be divided into layers based on its composition. We have homosphere. With regards to homosphere, below the, th the thermosphere, the composition of air remains fairly uniform, about 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen, but there is a turbulent mixing. This lower will, uh, I mean, this lower layer will mix region is known as the homosphere.
In the thermosphere, collisions between atoms and molecules are infrequent and the air is unable to keep itself steered. As a result, of course, this fusion takes over as heavier atoms and molecules tend to settle on the bottom of the layer because it's heavier as what I've said, while lighter gases such as hydrogen and helium float on the top. And the region from about the base of the thermosphere to the top of the atmosphere is often called as heterosphere. Next layer is the ionosphere. This ionosphere is not really a layer, but an electrified region where the upper atmosphere, where fairly large concentrations of ions and free electrons exist. Ions and atoms and molecules that have lost one or more electrons. The atoms lost uh, electrons and became positively charged when they cannot absorb all of the energy transferred to them by a colliding energetic particle of the sun's energy. From here, 60 kilometers, about 60 kilometers, the ionosphere extends upward to the top of the atmosphere. And because of that, here in this, in this uh, figure, the bulk of the ionosphere is in the thermosphere. Okay, that means bulk of ionosphere is in the thermosphere, which is in the hottest layer of the atmosphere. Ionosphere allows TV and FM radio waves to pass on through. At night, it reflects standard AM radio waves back to the Earth. That's why the situation will allow the, the AM radio waves to bounce repeatedly off the lower ionosphere and travel great distances. That's why it's much clearer during night. So the layer of atmosphere based on the temperature, the color red line here, the green composition, this is a composition, the color green line, and the electrical properties is in the blue line. An active sun is associated with large numbers of solar eruptions. So as what you can observe, the average sun here, this will be the average sun. And that's what you observe, the temperature tends to increase when it reaches a different uh, layers. Um, the highest will be in the thermosphere. As to this green line here, the composition, the heterosphere is, extends from the mesosphere going to exosphere. The homosphere, on the other hand, is from troposphere up to the mesosphere layer. And the ionosphere is extended from your lower than your mesosphere up to your exosphere, okay? To review, as what we have said, we have five layers of the atmosphere in terms of the temperature, varying temperatures. We have the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. But when we are talking with the layer of atmosphere, based on its composition, we have the heterosphere, homosphere, and your ionosphere. Okay? So let's proceed to weather and climate. Weather and climate play a major role in our lives. Weather, for example, often dictates the type of clothing we wear, while climate influences the type of clothing we buy. Why? Because in a weather, it occurs daily, and a, uh, the climate, it occurs um, longer than the weather. 
weather determines if these same crops will grow to maturity, while climate determines when, when to plant crops as well as what type of crops can be planted. Let's say here in the Philippines, if you rely on the climate, it determines the crops that, that are planted during rainy season and during sunny days. Okay? When we talk about weather, we are talking about the condition of the atmosphere at any particular time and place. Weather, which is always changing every day. So what are the elements of weather? Air temperature, the degree of hotness or coldness of the air. Air pressure, which is the force of the air above an area. The humidity, a pressure of amount of water vapor in the air. That's how humid our temp our our weather. Clouds, these are visible masses of tiny water droplets and or ice crystals that are above the Earth's surface. Precipitation, any form of water, either liquid or solid. Liquid, it's rain, and if it's uh, solid, it's snow. That usually falls from clouds and reaches the ground. Also, in weather, there is a visibility, the greatest distance of one can see. And the wind, the horizontal movement of the air. While climate, if we measure and observe these weather elements over a specific interval of time, say for many years, we would obtain the average weather or the climate of the particular region. Climate, therefore, represents the accumulation of the daily of the changing daily and seasonal weather events, the average range of weather over a long period of time. That's why from day every day, weather changes, while climate change in a long period of time. The concept of climate is much more than this, but for it also includes the extremes of the weather, how extreme the weather if we change climate as what we, we experience a strong typhoon because of this climate change. The heat waves of summer in Middle East, for example, and the cold spells of winter in colder regions of the earth that occur in a particular region, as what I've said. The frequency of these extremes is what helps us distinguish among climates that have similar average. Okay, the average temperature in the desert or in the cold regions or in the tropical regions. Earth's atmosphere in summary, I uh, sorry. In summary, the Earth's atmosphere is a mixture of many gases and in a volume of dry air near the surface, nitrogen occupies about 78%, which is the most um, uh, highest or the highest percentage in the atmosphere and followed by the oxygen, which is 21%. Some trace amounts such as water vapor, which normally occupies less than 4% in the volume of air near the surface, can condense into liquid cloud droplets or transform into delicate ice crystals. Both water vapor and carbon dioxide are important greenhouse gases. These are greenhouse gases that maintains the ambient temperature for the existence of life. Also, we have ozone layer, or the ozone, or the O3. Oxygen is O2, ozone is O3. This ozone in the, in the stratosphere protects life from harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun, or the UV radiation. At the surface, ozone is the main ingredient of photochemical smog. The major of water on 
our planet is believed to have come from its hot interior throughout gassing, although some of Earth's water may have come from collisions with meteors and comets. Atmospheric pressure at any level represents the total mass of air above the, that level, and atmospheric pressure always decreases with increasing height above the surface. The rate of which the air temperature decreases with height is called the lapse rate. A measured increase in air temperature with height is called the inversion. Also, we have discussed that the atmosphere may be divided into layers or regions according to its vertical profile of temperature, its gaseous composition, or its electrical properties. The warmest atmospheric layer is the thermosphere. The coldest is the mesosphere, and most of the gas ozone is found in the stratosphere. We leave that the bottom of the troposphere, which is an atmospheric layer where the air temperature normally decreases with height. And the troposphere is a region that contains all the weather with which we are familiar. That is why in the troposphere, the, uh, we cannot observe um, airplanes in the troposphere, but rather in the stratosphere. Because if the airplanes travel through the troposphere, there will be turbulence due to the clouds. That's why the airplanes must travel in the stratosphere layer. Also, the ionosphere is an electrified region of the upper atmosphere that normally extends from about 60 kilometers to the top of the atmosphere. Okay, I guess that's all the, the, the discussion regarding to our module. And uh, for online resources, you can uh, visit the link here, the ozone hole re education resources. Also, trends in carbon dioxide to monitor, monitor atmospheric carbon dioxide from NOAA's Earth System Research Lab on Mauna Loa in Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And water cycle summary. And for our references, we use the book of uh, Arends and Cram, Mulders and Cram. So I guess this will be the, the last slide. Thank you for your kind attention.